All right, uh, as I was saying, uh, good afternoon. I'm Kyle Dalton, the Membership and Development Coordinator for the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I've got some notes here to help me along, so I hope you don't mind if I peek down here and there. I'm here to answer your questions about combat medical evacuation in the Civil War. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, sort of a background there, hopefully prompt a few questions. We did receive some questions by email, by direct message uh, through Facebook, uh, so I'll be answering those questions that you sent ahead of time. Uh, but we're also here to answer any questions that might be prompted by what you hear. Uh, now, as I was saying, I'll be talking about the uh, medical evacuation of the period, something that all of us benefit from today. Uh, that's really our point here at the museum. Here at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, we're devoted to telling history of medicine and specifically how it impacts us today. Uh, that is our mission there. That's the whole reason we exist. And there are few moments where that story is more relevant than what we feel right now. Uh, if you think that mission is important, if you like the things we have to say, uh, then now is a great time to support us, to help us uh, carry that mission of hope amid this struggle. So uh, again, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I hope that you enjoy what you see. Uh, and I hope you'll consider becoming a member. That's really the best way to support us and our mission. Uh, and greetings to you, Brenda Blair, uh, uh, Biller, sorry, from Tom's River, New Jersey. Uh, feel free to chime in uh, where you're from. We got questions from Oregon, from New Jersey, uh, from all over the country, and I'll be answering those as we go. A quick preface. I am a social historian. That means that my background is in the study of common people, how they live their daily lives. That requires that I know uh, like material culture, you know, the models of ambulances or the leaders who are in charge. But my big focus is the average people, the average folks. Uh, so again, I'll be talking about those things, but some of these questions that you ask, I might have to say, I don't know. I may have to look it up. Uh, so just be prepared for that. And uh, greetings, Wendy from Pennsylvania. Glad to have all of you here. Uh, let's kick things off. I'm gonna give you a little background on uh, the history of medical evacuation in the Civil War, uh, in the ambulances, in the uh, stretcher bearers. Uh, and uh, hopefully I'll answer some of your questions as we go along. Feel free at any time to uh, send us a question through the feed here and, and I'll do my best to answer it. So prior to 1861, prior to the opening of the Civil War, the last major conflict on American soil was the War of 1812. That's 50 years before. In that conflict, only one half of 1% of all people who enlisted became casualties. By the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863, 3% of the United States Army was devoted to just removing the dead and the wounded. The Civil War was a conflict on industrial scale. We'd never seen anything like that before. Battles routinely ended with thousands of grievously wounded people scattered across miles. And this meant someone had to deal with that. Someone had to go and retrieve those people and hopefully save them. Amazon alone has 20,000 books on the American Civil War. And I'm sure there's many more beyond that. Uh, they've been publishing histories even before the war ended. But not one of those histories is devoted to medical evacuation, to the people who drove the ambulances, who carried the stretchers, who did the dirty first work of Civil War medical care. At most, you'll see a paragraph in a general medical history of the, uh, of the war. Uh, if you're lucky, in one of the few biographies of Dr. Jonathan Letterman, you'll see a chapter about uh, a medical evacuation. But it's not really about the medical evacuation. It's about the creation of the system, the creation of the United States Ambulance Corps. And I don't want to diminish that. That's a big deal. We'll talk about that. Uh, but I'd like to focus again more on sort of the average everyday people, the guys who are doing the dirty work. Uh, so today, as I said, I'll be exploring the history of combat medical evacuation. Uh, the opening of the war is a good place to start, uh, really where you should start. Prior to the American Civil War, uh, the immediate uh, years leading up to the Civil War, there is a good number of ambulances out west. That's really where most of the fighting for the U.S. Army is happening. And that's a very different conflict to the one that kicks off in 1861, uh, with the exception, of course, of the Far Western Theater in 1862. But for most of the Civil War, for most of the combat and, and most of the casualties, you're not fighting in the desert. 
Uh, you're not really uh, trying to get through really tough terrain. Uh, and so with little they have in medical evacuation doesn't really apply. So for example, the beginning of the uh, Civil War, the main ambulances they have are two-wheeled ambulances because those are a little bit more maneuverable. But that doesn't really fly uh, out here, out east. Uh, those ambulances are very rickety. They bounce a lot. Uh, there are a lot of people involved in evacuation, drivers, stretcher bearers, and the wounded themselves, who recall the pain that they experienced uh, of people being jostled around in these unsteady ambulances on really rough roads. There's a couple of accounts I read that state that uh, wounded were actually hitting the ceiling of the ambulance as it was bouncing down the road. And these are men with open bleeding wounds. That's not a great way to save people. The army was very ill-equipped for the beginning of the war. The Confederacy even more so. Uh, they simply did not have the resources that the North had. They didn't have the ambulances. They didn't have ambulance factories. Um, they did have some ambulances that they seized from arsenals and what have you, but it wasn't enough for the scale of what they were looking at. Another issue that they were running into is these ambulances themselves are not under command of the medical department. The ambulances are part of the quartermaster's department. Now that kind of makes sense on the face of it. The quartermaster is in charge of stuff, of the things that you need to use in, in wartime. Uh, another thing that sort of made sense to them, but clearly doesn't work, was relying on musicians to be the stretcher bearers, for musicians to be the ones conducting the evacuation. Uh, again, from their perspective, it makes sense. The musicians aren't doing anything anyway. They're already kind of seen as non-combatants. They're not carrying guns. Uh, so why not have them take care of that? Uh, but again, once you start running up to the realities of industrial violence, of the scale of human detritus in the Civil War, it simply doesn't fly, doesn't work. The ambulances themselves, uh, being under the quartermaster's department, are often misused. Uh, this goes back to the point of the quartermaster. The quartermaster is not a medical professional. His job is to get the stuff where it needs to be. Often that meant that ammunition had to get to the front, uh, extra weapons, uh, that kind of thing. And wagons are wagons. They'll, they'll do that. Uh, ambulance back then is not very different from some of the other wagons that existed at the time, supply wagons. You could load up an ambulance with shells and send it to the front. Uh, that, of course, excludes it from actually evacuating the wounded. This gets to a key argument, a key uh, debate that still exists among medical ethicists today. And that is, what do we prioritize? Do we prioritize victory or do we prioritize health care? And those are often seen as at odds. If you devote too many resources to medical evacuation, then you're giving up that stream of ammunition you need to get to the front to win. Uh, this is also true of the people needed for evacuation. The more good soldiers you have carrying stretchers, the fewer of them are on the front line with guns doing the work of violence. So in order to win the war, you have to make a choice. Uh, and that can be a really tricky one. That can be one that's answered in different ways by different commanders on both sides. But broad brush, the North and the South take two different approaches to this. For the South, it's uh, mostly we're going to prioritize victory. And this is made explicit by uh, General PGT Beauregard. Uh, just before the first battle of the Civil War, the first major battle, Bull Run, uh, he issues orders that he re repeats. Uh, he actually says them uh, again and again. Every single year of the war, he, he constantly reissues this order. Uh, he says that, uh, only the least effective men under arms, that's a direct quote, uh, least effective under arms, be assigned to the infirmary corps, that is the people who carry the wounded, uh, of his various commands. He justified this order every single time by writing, the surest way to protect our wounded is to drive the enemy from the field. The most pressing, highest duty is to win the victory. So he explicitly states, this is secondary to us. We, the surest way to care for the wounded is to keep the field. Uh, he's not totally wrong in that, but it does mean that he's prioritizing military victory over health care. Uh, in the North, again, this is a very broad brush, but in the North, you have kind of the opposite angle that's taken on that. For the first year or so of the war, uh, everybody pretty much kind of ignores the, the wounded. Uh, you've got what musicians you can get out there to help. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, they're, they're sort of left on their own. They're left to twist. Uh, 
Uh, and it's not until uh, late August of 1862 that uh, Dr. Jonathan Letterman, the uh, medical director of the Army of the Potomac, creates what's the, called the United States Ambulance Corps. This is the first permanent, dedicated, trained unit that s exists specifically to evacuate the wounded and remove the dead. Uh, this eventually spreads in 1864 uh, across all the armies. It's, it's dictated by an act of Congress, the Ambulance Corps Act. Uh, but this is the first time that there is an effort made to do that. There's better than one ambulance for every hundred men in the Army of the Potomac by the end of the war. Uh, as I said, uh, at Gettysburg, uh, this is according to the research of Benjamin Forrest, uh, there's 3% of the army devoted to the ambulance corps. Uh, this is a massive unit and a sea change. It, it really changes the way that uh, medical evacuation works. Uh, and we benefit from that today, as I said, immediately after the war, 1865, you have the first uh, civilian ambulance service in Cincinnati. Uh, and that's not an, a coincidence. Uh, Cincinnati was where they were producing uh, ambulances, hospital ships were coming and going from there. So they, they were directly inspired and informed by the Civil War. The next major ambulance service uh, came just a couple of years later in New York City and was established by a former Union surgeon. So these uh, benefits that, that we have today, they, they are a shadow of this. They are something we've inherited from this new system. So that's a, a quick overview of uh, sort of the background of Civil War medical evacuation. Uh, but I want to drill down a little bit deeper on some of these points. Uh, and we're going to do so with some of the questions that you asked. Uh, I've got a, a few questions here that were emailed uh, or messaged to us directly. Uh, the first of these comes from, just a moment. <laughs> uh, this comes from Bonnie Goldman of uh, Bordenton, Bordentown, New Jersey. She's an active member of the Bordentown Historical Society. Uh, she wanted to know uh, more about Clara Barton's role in all of this. Uh, Clara Barton wasn't involved in the uh, formation of an ambulance system. Uh, she wasn't involved in the creation of the ambulance system, but she was on the ground floor with the people that were doing it. Uh, she rode ambulances to Antietam. Uh, she writes about this in her papers. Uh, she uh, actually goes out of her way to say the thing that really sticks out to her is the amount of cursing that was going on. The ambulance drivers uh, were well known for cussing. They cussed a lot. Uh, and this is in an army of tens of thousands of young men away from home for the first time. Everybody's cursing up a storm. But uh, these guys in particular were, were noted for their uh, vocabulary. Uh, she scolds them, and uh, eventually they come back hat in hand, uh, penitent, uh, apologizing for their behavior. Uh, so she was there. She, she did see the ambulances. She rode in ambulances throughout the war. Uh, often she uh, rode in ambulances between hospitals. Uh, even though there were a lot of orders stating that ambulances were to be only used for the transportation of medical supplies and the wounded, they were often used for other things. And her use is a, a more legitimate one. There were others that uh, were used for transporting dignitaries around the field. Ambulances were used for exchanging prisoners. They were seen as neutral vehicles, something that was not to be fired on. So it made sense to, to put people in there that you didn't want to be fired on. Uh, of course, this gets muddled a little bit because the quartermaster department was using it to transport arms, which is an illegitimate use, which is a dangerous use because it does make them legitimate targets. Uh, but generally speaking, people weren't firing on ambulances and she used that to, to go between hospitals. Uh, to learn more about Clara Barton's role in the Civil War beyond the ambulances and medical evacuation, I suggest that you follow our uh, Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office page. The National Museum of Civil War Medicine is comprised of three sites. Uh, the one here in Frederick, uh, I'm in Frederick, by the way, uh, Frederick, Maryland. That's the, the sort of headquarters, if you will, the Cardi Building. It's a general history of the Civil War. Uh, we also have the Pry House Field Hospital. We have a uh, reconstructed ambulance there that you can see once we reopen. It's on Antietam National Battlefield. Uh, and of course, Clara Barton Missing Soldier's Office. Throughout uh, this series, this is the first in a series of uh, Q&As, uh, where we'll have various experts talking about their experiences, uh, their expertise. Uh, so throughout this, uh, we will be broadcasting more, uh, and we may be doing some that are specifically on Clara Barton. Definitely follow the uh, Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office page and uh, check out the website as well. Uh, so yeah, thank you, uh, Bonnie, for that question about Clara Barton. Uh, 
Uh, our next question comes from Patrick Vance of Salem, Oregon. Uh, he wrote to ask about the role of uh, Wheeling, West Virginia, uh, General Rosecrans uh, and Dr. Jonathan Letterman. Uh, so Rosecrans is, uh, of course, a famous general in, in general for the Civil War, <laughs> but he's also known in medical evacuation circles for inventing the Rosecrans Ambulance, or at least getting his name on it. Uh, the Rosecrans Ambulance was one of those four-wheeled ambulances that replaced the two-wheel ambulances. Uh, there's a few models of these that come out in the, in the period. It was produced in Wheeling, West Virginia, so it's known both as the Rosecrans Ambulance and the Wheeling ambulance. Uh, and it had a few innovations that, that worked really well for it. I happen to have a model here of a uh, four-wheeled ambulance. I think this is based on the Rucker ambulance. Uh, again, we've got a full-scale one of these that's a lot more impressive at the Pry House, so do check that out after, uh, after the crisis has passed. So uh, these four-wheeled ambulances had very heavy springs on them. You can see down here there's, there's, <laughs> there's uh, springs inside, and that was meant to cushion the ride. It didn't work that well, but it was definitely better than just an ox cart or something. Uh, in the back, uh, we'll open that up where you can see it, there's uh, little seats in there that would fold out and create beds. Uh, so that was a way for the soldiers to, to lay down if they couldn't sit, if their wounds kept them from doing so. Uh, some ambulances, like the Coolidge, came along with their own stretchers that were almost like a, uh, a, uh, a tempurpedic bed. They would bend to whatever angle you needed them to. You can see uh, examples of the, an example of this Coolidge stretcher uh, in our Cardi building location in downtown Frederick. We have an original that's on display. Uh, so these ambulances were developed uh, through the Civil War. It's one of the areas where you do see a major technological improvement. Uh, and uh, the Rosecrans is, is just one of those. Uh, the most popular of these was the Rucker Ambulance. The Rucker Ambulance was so successful that it continued in use after the Civil War and into the early 20th century. You can actually see uh, some videos in the Library of Congress, some film that was taken in uh, about 1905 that shows a Rucker Ambulance in use. It's actually rolling onto the field as they're training National Guard troops how to carry stretchers and stuff. Uh, so that's, again, a direct benefit of the Civil War. You're seeing ambulances, uh, ambulance models that are a lot more uh, thought out, I guess you could say, uh, that, that come from the Civil War. Our modern ambulances today, the stuff you hear driving down the street, uh, those all come from this period. Uh, so again, direct benefit for the period. Uh, next question. Thank you, Patrick, for that, that uh, question out of Salem, Oregon. Uh, let's see. Uh, Michael Benavinia, I hope I pronounced that right. I'm sure I didn't, but I hope I did. Uh, asked uh, if a serious effort was made, I'm oh, sorry, uh, asks uh, if there was any impact on scarcity of material that forced designers to use alternative or new materials in the design and fabrication of the ambulances and stretchers during the Civil War? Yes and no. Uh, for ambulances, not as much, uh, except that there are decisions made and perhaps those are influenced by a lack of materials. So as I said, in the North, ambulances are a major focus. There's more than one for every hundred soldiers by the end of the war. In the South, there's not even close to that number. Uh, we don't have good numbers on that. The records of the uh, Confederate Medical Department burned at the end of the war. Uh, but we know anecdotally from the records that, or rather the memoirs, the letters, the diaries people are writing at the time, that there's just not a lot down there. There's there's not a lot of ambulances. They capture what ambulances they can, uh, but they're not producing many. There's a couple of different ways to take this. One is that uh, it, it's the usual story. The South just didn't have that many materials. They just didn't have as much as the North had. Uh, and that is true. Uh, but I think when we look also at their mentality, uh, when it comes to uh, prioritization of evacuation of the wounded, it's just not there. They're, they're just not doing it. There's no significant effort, even close to the scale of the North, to create a permanent trained band of uh, medical evacuation. You have a couple of halting attempts. Uh, Captain uh, Hebrig's, Hebrig's uh, Infirmary Corps out of Richmond, uh, and that kind of falls apart. It doesn't really work out. Uh, he has, I think, maybe 50 people, and, and there's a lot of desertion. Um, there's not, and that's for the entire Army of Northern Virginia. That's, that's a, not enough people. Uh, you have soldiers that get assigned right before the battle. Uh, 
There's a soldier from Tennessee who writes about uh, just about an hour before the fight being told that he's going to be a stretcher bearer, and they don't give him a stretcher. He has to just carry people off. Uh, so it, it could be that the lack of materials in the South was one of the reasons they didn't prioritize medical evacuation. Uh, coupled with that, again, military philosophy of the more we put into it, the less we have to put into something else. Uh, the less we put into ammunition caissons, the less we put into cannons, the less we put into uh, all the other things that you need, forage uh, wagons, that kind of stuff. Uh, this was not, strictly speaking, absolutely necessary for, medical, for uh, a military victory. Uh, it is humane. Uh, I think it's the right thing to do. But uh, at the same time, if it's either that or lose the war, and, and that may have been one of the calculations they were making, uh, then you can see why they wouldn't emphasize that. Uh, you do see some slapdash uh, stretchers. We've got one on display. Uh, it's a Confederate stretcher that is, uh, it looks like a couple of like table legs almost uh, that have been carved to allow for a wooden net underneath it. And that's what's going to hold up the, the wounded as they go. Uh, it doesn't work great. Uh, it's, it sags a lot, which can be especially bad for, for certain wounds. Uh, so that's not, that's not great, but it, it does, they do have that. Uh, that appears to be an answer to a lack of materials. Uh, you see some uh, stretcher models in the north that are developed. Uh, they try to make them as cheaply as possible uh, to make them more available. Uh, and these don't tend to last very long. They fall apart pretty quick. Uh, the United States Sanitary Commission model, for example, uh, was a model that folded into itself. Uh, it, it would flatten out, you'd fold it shut, uh, and you'd, you'd uh, have that more easily carried to the front lines. It was also quite light, uh, which was a major problem for stretchers at the time. Uh, the two main stretcher models of the Civil War weighed an average of 26 pounds. Uh, that's on top of the guy going on top. Uh, so they were trying to cut back on materials in that way. But the limitation of materials don't really manifest in the way you would expect it to. It's more an absence than an adaptation. They're just not building stretchers. They're not building ambulances in the South. Uh, and uh, again, that may have been a, a sort of offshoot of lack of supplies, but you don't see a lot of adaptation when it comes to, to medical evacuation. Uh, so uh, another question we got... Uh, I uh, wanted to know about the role of black stretcher bearers and ambulance drivers in the Civil War. Uh, I wrote a blog post about this. You can see it on our website. Uh, it's about uh, the contraband and United States colored troops in medical evacuation. Uh, the beginning of the war, uh, you in, in the North, again, there's, they're trying to figure out how to deal with the, the flow of bodies, how they're going to get these people to the, the help that they need. Uh, and they're trying all kinds of things. Uh, the musicians, obvious civilian volunteers, um, soldiers from the front line will just up and leave. Uh, there's a, a guy, uh, Bowditch, uh, who writes to Congress trying to argue for an ambulance corps, and he talks about how uh, one guy got shot, and they evacuated, like, uh, eight different people, carried him off the field. Uh, and some of that was genuine concern, I'm sure, for their comrade. And also, it was a good excuse to not get shot at. Uh, so there is, uh, there is that as a problem, uh, and they're trying to find a more efficient way of doing it. Uh, there's a big debate in newspapers at the time saying, hey, we've got all these uh, formerly enslaved people running to our lines. Why don't we have them do it? They're, you know, pitching in around anyway. They're doing a lot of cooking. They're digging trenches. They're driving wagons. Uh, why not let them do it? Uh, others are a little bit more... Um, paternalistic in that, a little more insulting, uh, saying, well, hey, they're, they're taking our, our resources anyway. We're feeding them. Let's make them work. Uh, this, of course, ignores that they were already doing it. Uh, there were a good number of black ambulance drivers uh, in the first year of the war uh, and continued to be uh, throughout the war. In uh, 1863, this is made moot when uh, the Emancipation Proclamation is issued. Uh, those, uh, along with that comes the United States Colored Troops, uh, and, uh, it looks like we might be missing some questions in the comments here. I am missing some questions in the comments here. Oh, okay. I'll come back to those in just a second. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, yes, the, uh, uh, United States colored troops, uh, they, they start doing it, uh, on their own. They're, they're folded into the system of, uh, medical evacuation, the ambulance corps, uh, that, that already exists in the army of the Potomac. In uh, other places, like Sherman's army, as he's marching through Georgia, uh, they would liberate enslaved people. Uh, they would enlist them as undercooks, 
and those undercooks would serve as sort of unofficial stretcher bearers. Uh, they suffer immense casualties, as do stretcher bearers in, uh, throughout the conflict. All uh, right, so we got a couple other questions here. Let's see. Um, uh, Williamsburg Battlefield Association uh, says that they've heard stories about uh, Richmond sending some omnibuses, question mark, uh, to the battlefields around Richmond. Does the Confederate government impress civilian vehicles throughout the war? They do, but I don't know if they were doing it for ambulances. Uh, it's, it's a little unclear. The Richmond effort was actually by the civilians themselves. It was not by the Confederate government. Uh, it was the Richmond Ambulance Committee. They were civilian volunteers, about 150 uh, ambulances, I think, or, or maybe 150 people. It's a big difference. Uh, either way, they were the only significant medical evacuation unit for the Army of Northern Virginia for significant parts of the war. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, and there are some armbands that exist from this. They have these red armbands that said uh, Ambulance Committee. Um, and uh, you'll find those in the American Civil War Museum in Richmond. Uh, but that is a civilian-led effort. Those are volunteers choosing to do it. The Confederate government uh, was, you know, voicing support for it, but not actually leveraging real support for it. It was by a committee of civilians uh, in Richmond. Uh, I, I don't know if they impressed any vehicles uh, as ambulance wagons. I wouldn't be surprised they did. It's a big war. Uh, but I, I wouldn't say it's policy. I wouldn't say that it's common. All right, let's see uh, what other questions we got in the comments here. Uh, da, 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 da. How quickly were supplies and uh, medicine manufactured and deployed to the lines? This is from uh, Brenda Bilar. I hope I'm getting your name right on that. Um, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, at the beginning of the war, there's not a lot of effort made to, to do that. Um, but uh, by 1862, in the North at least, you're seeing a, a major effort. You're seeing a lot of wagons being produced in a lot of places and being deployed to the front. It, there are uh, ambulance depots or, or wagon manufactories in Philadelphia, uh, Cincinnati. Um, there's uh, also maintenance is a big deal. The ambulance corps was created with its own farrier unit. Uh, people to shoe the horses. Uh, they had mobile forges that would follow the ambulances around. Uh, so in the North, there's a major effort. Uh, as I said earlier in the South, there's basically no effort. Uh, and uh, it, it's telling too, because they do prioritize certain medical manufacturers. There's a whole bunch of factories throughout the South to try and produce uh, anesthetics because that is recognized as a big deal, as a thing you need to compensate for. But you see no similar system for producing ambulances in the South. Uh, oftentimes, they're relying on whatever wagons they can get. Again, captured Union wagons, if you're lucky. Uh, if not, then just wagons that don't have springs, wagons that are flat and meant to be hauling stuff, not wounded people. Uh, and that can be bad news. Uh, this is probably uh, one of the most significant factors in uh, the higher mortality rate among Confederate wounded Confederate soldiers than among uh, wounded Union soldiers. Uh, so how quickly were the supplies produced? Um, I can't give you exact numbers, but pretty dang quick in the North and basically none in the South. All right, let's see what else we got. All right, uh, John Lustria is asking, uh, he says, obviously civilians helped with medical care in the aftermath of battles, but did civilians ever help with medical evacuation? They did. Uh, I mentioned the case, I'm sure you posted this before I said that. I mentioned the case of the Richmond Ambulance Committee. That's the most organized, uh, either North or South. Uh, you do have uh, material support from the United States Sanitary Commission. They produce wagons, they produce ambulances, they produce uh, stretchers, uh, they, they produce supplies that help. Uh, I, I think that there are some cases of them helping uh, behind the lines. I don't know of any Sanitary Commission people doing evacuation from the battlefield itself. On the battlefield, you do see some volunteers that are unorganized. There's a case of a preacher, uh, one of the uh, chaplains for a regiment, who goes to the front lines and is helping to load people onto an ambulance. One of the drawbacks with civilians is that uh, they aren't exposed to the trauma of Civil War battlefields before they get there. The United States Ambulance Corps is established with, uh, as Dr. Letterman puts it, the most active and efficient soldiers. They want only people who've already seen combat, uh, if it can be helped. 
Uh, and this is a big deal. They're, they're heading into an active battlefield. Their casualties are very high. And they're seeing the worst remnants of Civil War battlefields. They're seeing broken bodies. They're hearing screaming. Uh, there's many accounts of people writing decades after the fact saying how visceral that was for them, how they can still hear the voices of the wounded. Uh, and these civilians have no prior combat experience. They've never seen that before. It's what uh, military psychologists call a novel stressor. Novel stressors are much harder to deal with uh, than things you've already been exposed to. And over time, uh, you develop coping mechanisms. They can be negative or positive, but by the time the ambulance corps comes around, they've got a whole army that's been through a year of combat. Uh, and they start to figure out uh, those negative and uh, positive combat reactions. Uh, and that's how they, they are better able to sift through. So civilians can help, and they do throughout the war, uh, but they're not as significant as the, uh, the, the stretcher bearers who are trained, uh, the soldiers themselves, and the musicians. The musicians uh, remain uh, as evacuees, uh, or rather um, evacuation personnel, through the end of the war. Thanks for your question, John. Uh, let's see. Uh, Steve, Ann, I also want to be Jake Wynn when I grow up. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, da -da -da, scroll down a little bit. Uh, Sanitary Commission. Were no ambulances or stretchers imported from European armies? That's a good question. Uh, I haven't come across that, but it's also not something that I've researched in particular. The influence of Europe on medical evacuation cannot be overstated. Uh, it was a big deal. They, they referenced them, the surgeons referenced uh, European uh, methods of evacuation uh, throughout the war uh, in journals, uh, in medical manuals. Uh, the Confederate surgeon John Julian Chisholm, uh, Chisholm, Chisholm uh, he writes specifically about methods of identification that the French wore, uh, these red headbands that would be marked with ambulance corps, uh, but in French. Uh, and so they, they do have a lot of influence coming from there. Uh, I don't know of any that are imported. Uh, ambulances take up a lot of space. They're, they're huge. It would be hard for the South to justify loading those onto ships uh, and replacing other more vital medical supplies, uh, your morphine, your chloroform, um, your quinine. Uh, those, you can fit a lot of those in the space that an ambulance would take up. Uh, they are also difficult to repair if you don't already have the facilities for it, if they're not models that uh, you yourself are producing. It can be done, uh, and certainly they jury-rigged a lot of stuff uh, in the South, but uh, I don't know of any uh, importation of ambulances specifically or stretchers. Uh, the stretcher models in the North uh, were, were mostly local manufacturer. You can find a lot about this in the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. There's a whole section on different models of uh, stretchers. Um, but uh, I don't know of any that were, that were directly imported. Uh, so good question, Chris, uh, Chris Headland, I think that is. Uh, so yeah, those are, those are all, um, Good questions so far. Uh, if you've got any more, feel free to uh, throw them down uh, in the comments section. I've got a couple other questions that I think were uh, messaged to us. Uh, I think I've answered most of these, actually. Well, uh, if there's one thing that I want to leave you with, uh, it's that... Oh, we got one here, actually. <laughs> did you mention the price to construct an ambulance? I did not because I don't know it. Uh, thankfully, though, uh, those those uh, numbers do exist, uh, again, in the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. Uh, they, uh, they do talk a little bit about the cost of ambulances, and that is not an insignificant factor. After the war, uh, we actually sent some ambulances, stretchers, to a World's Fair in Paris, uh, and we put it up against uh, European models. That kind of brings us back to our, our previous question. And one thing that is written about by the military and medical advisors of all these European uh, empires, many of which are translated to English and published in the US and the UK, uh, one thing they write about a lot is the relative cost. How much is this gonna cost us? Uh, they're looking down the barrel at this point at industrialized conventional warfare, and everyone's terrified of it. They've seen what's happened in uh, America in the Civil War. Uh, they saw the War of the Triple Alliance in South America. Uh, they've seen the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, and they're seeing these mass casualty events that they hadn't experienced really since Napoleon. And everybody's starting to recognize, we better get on board. We better figure out how to do this. And so the World's Fair served as a way of sort of shopping around for different models. 
and they know they're going to have to mass produce these. They know they're going to have to make a lot of them. So cost is a big factor. Uh, again, specific numbers, I, I don't have a have that on hand, sorry. Uh, but again, check the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. Uh, there's a, a number of digitized transcribed copies that you can search uh, on, on Google. Uh, so thanks for that question. First-hand accounts, uh, Steve, or sorry, Sean Dyer asks if there are any first-hand accounts uh, to read about the Ambulance Corps. There's uh, a few. The first that I would suggest is Hayward Emmel. He was a stretcher bearer uh, and he came pretty late to the Ambulance Corps game. Uh, he had served in the infantry at the Wilderness uh, and, and really throughout the war. Uh, and he came, he came in pretty late. Uh, but that's also a pretty common experience for the time. Uh, there's a lot of veterans that become ambulance corpsmen, that become ambulance drivers and especially stretcher bearers. Uh, and his is an excellent, uh, excellent journal uh, where he goes through day by day and just talks about his experiences. The other one that I would suggest, uh, I've got it here in my notes, uh, William A. Leonard. William A. Leonard is an ambulance driver. He also does not start as an ambulance driver. He also starts as a, a soldier. Uh, and his uh, journal and his letters are all published online for free uh, through the uh, University of Virginia Library, I believe. Uh, and again, those are free. Uh, you, can, you can find those online, read them right now. Uh, they're also uh, text searchable. So if there's a certain thing you're looking for, that's a great way to do it. But I suggest kind of just reading straight through both of those. It really drills down to sort of the mundane nature of uh, Civil War life, uh, which I'm sure you've seen in other uh, primary source accounts uh, at the time. Uh, but uh, yeah, those two are, are the best. Uh, there's a few others out there. Most of them are in um, archives, in libraries. The University of Virginia has, uh, or rather, the, sorry, Library of Virginia has a couple of copies. You do have to physically go in person, and obviously we can't do that right now. Uh, but they've got a couple of, of originals. Uh, so thank you for your question, Sean. That was a good one. Uh, Zach Whitlow asks, uh, how was the Ambulance Corps organized around Washington, D.C.? That's a good question. Uh, so it's uh, a little different in DC than it is in the field. Uh, so in the field, they're organized by division. Uh, within that division, I think it's uh, 10, uh, 10 ambulances per brigade or something. Um, but uh, the division ambulance corps follows the division into combat. Uh, oftentimes you have the individual uh, ambulances attached to the regiments they were drawn from. They'll follow them into combat. Uh, in cities, it's a little bit different. Uh, they do use ambulances throughout uh, these major cities, often referred to as here in Frederick, uh, as one vast hospital. Uh, these areas would have an ambulance depot, a warehouse, uh, a permanent forge, unlike those that, that follow uh, into combat, or rather uh, follow the army anyway. Uh, so the ambulances are here in, in cities like Frederick, like Washington, D.C., uh, and I don't think they're actually organized by a unit level. I think they're directly under command of, of the medical department. I could be wrong on that. I'm going to look that up, but that's the impression that I get. That these guys are on truly detached service. Uh, and uh, it's interesting when you look at the original records of ambulance corpsmen, it'll often say detached to, uh, it'll say detached to division, detached to a city. Uh, so they, they aren't with their regiment. Uh, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Uh, and it's been kind of interesting to try and sort out which is which. That's not totally clear in the records all the time. This also appears to be a product of uh, knowledge of the Ambulance Corps. There's a captain uh, who writes, he's a captain of the Ambulance Corps, and he writes uh, in 1864 that the Army seemed unaware of the existence of the Ambulance Corps, uh, which is kind of a big deal. Uh, if it makes up that much of the army and it's that important, you'd hope people would know a little more about it. Uh, but again, that gets back to what we were saying earlier about the, the ethics of medical evacuation. While well, you prioritize fighting and winning or saving the wounded. Uh, and uh, those calculations are, are made differently for different people. Thank you for your question, Zach. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Uh, <laughs> uh, I am talking about old tiny wheeled vehicles. You're correct, Drew. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, uh, being an ambulance, which I assume gets nasty, how are they cleaned, repaired, and maintained? Good question. Uh, so for repair, uh, it's for the North anyway, uh, 
there are those mobile farriers and mobile forges. Uh, there are wagon depots. Uh, sometimes in the, the records of ambulance drivers, they'll talk about um, taking their ambulance to a nearby city and having it worked on there. Um, but oftentimes they're not maintained very well. That same captain who complained that people didn't seem to know that the ambulance corps existed uh, also had a heck of a time getting paint. He just could not get paint for his dang ambulances. Uh, and I mean, that's not just to make it look good. It also helps to maintain your vehicle. Your wagons are going to start splintering. They're going to start uh, falling apart if you don't seal them. And paint is a great way to do that. Uh, paint can also serve to distinguish your ambulance from other vehicles in the field. If you give it a, a, a green color, then maybe it won't look like uh, one of those ammunition wagons that's going to the front. There is no uniform system of paint, I should say that. Uh, they seem to be black and unpainted and green. Uh, but again, that goes back to uh, the maintenance. Sometimes maintenance just doesn't happen. Uh, you would hope that it would, but it does not always happen. Uh, so there, there are mobile forges for the north. There's uh, wagon depots for the north. Uh, and there's also neglect. In the south, it's almost uniformly neglect. There's very few, uh, relatively, ambulances. And if you're lucky, you're going to have something like the Richmond Ambulance Committee, where you have civilians putting up their own money and their own time to maintain those things and fix them. Uh, but generally, the Army doesn't make an effort in the South to, uh, to build or, or maintain those wagons. They do get those ambulance wagons, unless, of course, they're planning on using them for something other than being an ambulance. Uh, and then again, there's priority of what other wagons have to be worked on. Good question from uh, Civil War Trails. Uh, thank you for, uh, for saying nice things about me. I appreciate that. Uh, hope you guys have had a good time on this. Uh, we're coming up on the 45 minute mark. I think, uh, it's, it's fair for me to, uh, to let you off the hook now. Hope you've enjoyed this presentation and be sure to tune in for future presentations. We're going to have more question and answer sessions on different topics. Uh,